Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. So we are officially kicking off our summer farm tour series today with no-till farming legends, Jay and Polly Armour of Four Winds Farm in New York, talking about their super simple, super productive, organic compliant composting system. Jay and Polly are where I took the inspiration for my own static aerated compost system, but theirs is designed around the use of a tractor and front end loader and can do well over double the amount of compost that mine can. So hopefully between the two videos, you can see if this system would be right for you and how to build your own. The first few minutes are a bit about the history of how this system came about, followed by the nitty gritty details of how it works. Also, there's a really fascinating tidbit about chunky compost in there. It's worth listening to. Anyway, last thing, you know how I'm always like, you can support this work by becoming a Patreon member or buying a copy of the Living Soil Handbook or merch at notillgrowers.com. Well, this series is a direct result of that support and we were able to send my partner at notillgrowers.com, Jackson Roulette, up to the East Coast to film some of the best no-till farms in the country. That's real, you did that, so thank you. Now, without further rambling from me, here is Jane Polly Armour of Four Winds Farm. Hi, I'm Jay Armour. I'm Polly Armour. And we're co-owners of Four Winds Farm in Gardner, New York, in the beautiful Hudson Valley. We had a friend who was an <laughs> itinerant uh, grass-fed beef farmer and he had a herd of beef cattle, but he did not have land. He he Didn't rented have a farm. He, he rented land from other people for his his cattle and he needed a place to put his cows uh, for the winter. And at that point we were still making hay. Uh, and we only had a small flock of sheep. So we always made more hay than we needed and didn't have enough manure. And we said, Hey, we'll we'll keep your cows for the winter in exchange for their manure and two of your babies. And so uh, that's what we did. And we ended up with, with all this cow poop. I mean, one large cow is 50 pounds per day per animal. We thought, wow, this is wonderful. Um, we we, also, we the, also realized how wonderful cows are as yeah. animals. I've always been afraid of cows because they're big. But, uh, you know, after having them and feeding them every day and interacting with them and realize, oh, they're, they're, they're better than sheep. The sheep run away from you, but the cows yeah. come up to you. The sheep are hard to keep in, and the cows, you can keep them in with a, a single strand of electric. Um, so we ended up uh, buying this person's cows from them because we just love them. And that was another turning point for the farm, was getting our own, our own uh, herd of cows. Um, we started collecting their manure. We learned all about raising them outside on, on pasture. And we started getting um, manure from a horse farm uh, to mix in with it. Uh, so, because cow, cow manure is pretty gloppy by itself, but when you mix it with horse manure and the shavings or straw that are usually with horse manure, it makes a really nice mix and it composts well. So we were doing, you know, just uh, I think what you would call static pile. We'd take yeah. take the the cow manure, mix it with the horse manure, put it in a in a pile, and just let it sit for a while, um, and you know keep an eye on it and all that. But then we'd turn it after weeks or months. We'd turn it once or twice, and the following year use it on the garden. And then Jay, well, what out, what ha what happened was. In the early years, the, the organic regulation wasn't uh, really solidified as far as uh, definitions between compost and manure. We are a, a certified organic operation, and so the certification is important to us. Maybe some of the people don't know what the, uh, the, the rule is. Uh, when you're making compost, if you're using a static row, um, you have to turn it a, a minimum of five times over a 15-day period and maintain the temperature between 131 and 170 degrees. Um, there's a, another way you can make compost and that's with a forced air system. And with that, you set it all up, you 
pump air through the pile and you need to maintain that temperature between 131 degrees and 170 degrees for three days and that's it you don't have to turn it or anything like that and so um, I started scratching my head trying to figure out you know how can you get there? How, how can I get there? You know, three days is a whole lot better than 15 days. Especially and if I, you don't have to turn I it. I don't my have to God. turn it. So, so that was my challenge, was trying to figure out how to do that. And so uh, one day I went online and I looked at, you know, I Googled compost. Some of them are like, oh, I could do that. You know, it was just a series of pipes on the ground and a fan pushing air through the pipes. And I knew that somewhere in our barn, <laughs> you it's know, a problem there's, with there's barns, always, right? yeah, junk there's, expands there's to fill always, the space provided. There's always something in your barn <laughs> that you can find for whatever project you've got in your head. And so I knew somewhere in that barn we had a fan that came out of a, an old greenhouse that was used for a heating system in a greenhouse hooked it up to pipes and laid it out in the barnyard and put the manure on it and turned it on and you know fan was running constantly because that's the way the picture looked <laughs> and the pile did not heat up then I found out that the reason it didn't heat up was because I was moving too much air through the pile and what I needed was a timer to turn that fan on and off and while talking to somebody, I learned that I could get the exact timer that I needed from a hydroponic supply store. Uh, they use that sort of thing for hydroponic systems for circulating water. And so I got one of those and I put it on and I set it up and sure enough the pile heated up. And I thought, wow, this is great. And that's how we make compost now. Um, in terms of where, what was this? seven or eight years ago I yeah, started doing this. That. The way I'm doing it now is the same way as I was doing it back then. Um, the, the issue with the fan, uh, the fan is what they call a duct fan uh, used in forced air. I mean, uh, it's a squirrel, you, squirrel you cage know. fan. So you could, you could scab one from like an old uh, forced air furnace. But the, the problem with the duct fan is that Ductwork is rectangular and pipes are circular. So I had to go from this rectangular opening to this circular uh, pipe that I use underneath the piles. And so I got a short square bucket, cut a round hole in the bottom, and I put, uh, I made a, a tapered pipe out of funnel uh, sort of a thing yeah out yeah. of uh, the side of an above ground um, swimming pool sort of rolled it a certain way and put a big hose clamp around it <laughs> and stuck that into the hole and the other end into the four inch pipe that I used for the uh, circulating the air that's what I did seven years ago and that's what I still have so I, I mean I could modernize the whole thing if I wanted to but yeah they probably make I'm sure they make pieces of duct work that would negate the need for the cob job, but the cob job works fine, so why muck with it, you know? We have the squirrel cage fan, which is in like an old dog house to protect it from weather. And from that fan comes the, the bucket and the, and the above ground pool stuff and so forth going to just four inch PV, you know, schedule, schedule 40, schedule 80, PVC, it comes out and then it splits uh, into a, a sort of a manifold. So it comes out and you can do, we've done as many as four, yeah. uh, four lines coming off it right now. They're about, would you say three feet apart, two feet apart? Yeah, about three feet three apart. Three feet apart. So it comes out and it splits. The, the numbers are arbitrary. Yeah, there's uh, there's it, no rhyme or reason why scale I chose it, the... Scale it to the space that you have and how you access it. So these, these four inch pipes come out, they have holes drilled in them about every four inches, six inches apart. Um, we use, you know, rigid schedule, schedule 80 now, I guess we've moved to. Yeah, I guess that's, that's the one, one big change. Yeah, you move from when, schedule when 40 to schedule 80. When I first did this, I used the, the, the white 
perforated pipe. Yeah, sewer and drain. And pipe. that just collapsed from the heat and the weight of the yeah the manure being yeah. piled on it. So I use a Schedule 80 now. Yep. So he he sets these up uh, on a bed of wood chips. And we get the wood chips from, you know, the power company or when we have tree work done here, we just stockpile them. Uh, so he lays down a bed of wood chips and has the pipes laid out parallel to each other, about three feet apart. And on top of that, he I starts to pile, pile the, pile the, the manure. horse manure, the cow manure, whatever well, garden okay. waste we have. Yeah, I, we truck in horse manure from a nearby horse farm. Yeah. And I mixed the cow manure in with the horse manure. You know, I'll dump the horse manure in the, in the barnyard dump the cow manure there, pile it up a little bit, let it sit for a little while, and then I mix it using forks on the tractor, mix that up a little bit, and then I dump that on these pipes. And he, he does it, what, about six feet tall? Yeah, as far as, as tall as I can make it, really. With the, with the bucket loader. You'll, you'll see our tractor. Our, the equipment we use for this is the tractor with the bucket loader attachment and the forklift attachment. That's all we use. Um, and That's really all the equipment we use yeah, on the farm, too. Yeah, pretty much. And uh, so he builds it about six feet tall, which is about the amount you can comfortably dump with the bucket loader that we have. And it's, I guess, about 15 well, feet um, wide? 28 feet. 28 feet long. Each, each uh, section is 14 feet okay. of pipe. A pipe. So. so I've got two sections of pipe, so that's 28 feet. 28 feet long by... The width of the thing, and that's that's it. The and the the blower is plugged into just a standard house current coming out of the barn, um, and he builds it. And within how many what a two day days. or two two days, it's up to temperature. Right now, it's at I think one sixty two or something. And you built it yesterday. Three days ago. Three days ago, um, and so there it sits for as long as we leave the thing on. Um, Usually it's about 15 days. Yeah. You know, I keep records for three days because that's what I'm required to do. Right. I usually write the final temperature when I take that apart and put a new pile on there just mm -hmm. for my own interest. Um, the first pile that I made this year, I didn't get around to doing the next pile for a month. <laughs> But, it, I mean, it can't hurt it to stay there longer than yeah. two weeks or whatever. Yeah. So it, it sits there until I get to it. Yep. Yeah. But it's it's a great system because it's pretty much set it and forget it. As far as how long to keep it on or off, uh, I read it somewhere. I don't know where I got the information from. Um, was told three minutes on, 20 minutes off. Okay. And the neat thing about this particular style of timer, it's, it's called an Aptart timer. And it can be set so that it goes on for three minutes and then it goes off for 20 minutes. So the, the, the numbers are, are sort of arbitrary, but the really neat thing is that I can look at the temperature of the pile and, you know, if it's getting too hot, increase the amount of time that that fan stays on to cool it down some. So, you know, the, a good starting point for anybody would be three minutes on, 20 minutes off. And then tweak it. Yeah, look at what your um, temperature is and make adjustments accordingly. Yeah, another, another question that I get a lot of times is uh, what happens in the wintertime? You know, because you sort of think, well, uh, you know, summertime, it's, it's warm out. Um, it's, it, the air temperature is not affecting the ability of the pile to make heat. What's, what's making the heat are the microbes that are in the manure. If you give them the right amount of oxygen, they'll get really excited and do a lot of work in there and produce the heat, produce the, hen the energy, the heat. And so it really doesn't matter what temperature that oxygen is that's moving through there. Uh, generally, when I do this during the winter, it'll take maybe three or four days to get up to temperature rather than two days. But that's about the only difference. I think another important thing to keep in mind about our compost, and um, it's something I mention a lot to, to um, beginning farmers that are 
trying a, you know, you know using their compost in a no-till environment. Um, our compost is not screened. So, you know, when it comes from the horse farm, there's shavings in the manure, there's um, hay that the cows and the horses don't eat that gets mixed in there. So the, the compost is very fibrous and that creates something, a product that sticks around on the bed. The reason we're putting it on the bed is to suppress weeds. And when you purchase compost from a compost manufacturer, they screen that compost. They screen it for a number of reasons. There's bits of trash that's in there. There's um, sometimes they're using a lot of um, yard waste, so there's branches and so forth that don't get fully compo composted. So they want to screen that stuff out. A lot of times they, you know, screen it out and they put it back onto the next pile that they're making so it eventually gets worked down. But they end up with this, these little pellets. And very, those, very fine product. Those pellets break down after about a month and a half. So if you're putting it on your bed to suppress the weeds in May, uh, by July, that's going to be decomposed, decomposed to the point where it's no longer sitting on the bed and you lose the, uh, the, the weed suppressing the mulch trait aspect of it of, of your compost. Whereas our compost sticks around all, well, sometimes it'll stick around two years. I guess the answer to how much do we need to make or how much do we make is never enough. Um, we've used up everything I made last year for this year, and we could use more. What's our limiting factor? <laughs> uh, my time. Your time. Yeah. Yeah. It's and it's not that you don't have the time. It's that you're doing other things. I'm doing other things. Yeah. yeah you've kind of moved away from from much of the farming duties and are now semi-retired. We're trying to be. Trying to be, yeah. I mean, we, we could make more compost. We simply don't. Well, it means more hauling of uh, horse manure. Horse farms seem to be popular around here, and uh, a lot of the horse farmers, you know, the, they're... It's a waste product yeah, for them. Yeah, it's a waste product for them. Yeah. They have to pay somebody to take it away, and they're happy that I'll come along and take it away for nothing. Yeah, we have a, a small uh, dump trailer that we use, and there's a, a horse farm about three miles away that uh, we, we take our dump trailer and we park it there. And as they muck out, they muck right into the trailer and they give Jay a call saying, come take your trailer, it's full. And so he goes down there, gets it, brings it back and dumps it in the barnyard and we stockpile it there. Every time I move a pile, I keep thinking, I'm going to count how many buckets I'm doing. And then I get like halfway through and I lose count. Um, producing like 120 to 150 yards of compost during a, in any given season. This is the barnyard, yeah. and the cows are in this space during the winter. And so we've got this uh, area of the barn that's open. This, this all faces south, and so um, it's sheltered from the north wind, and it's, gets, the sun is low, so it gets some sun, and uh, the cows are pretty happy here. We feed them in the barn, and they hang out there, and they leave their manure in there and uh, that's where we collect it. So all winter long, it gets piled up in there. They pile it up in there. <laughs> and uh, then this time of year, I slowly dig it out and mix that with horse manure that I truck in. And then it goes onto the pipes here. So 140, 160. Well, 158, 157, I think it is. Pretty hot, and that's about where I want it to be. So what I do is I let it sit like this for about a week, 
And then I actually come in here and I turn this with the forks of the tractor. I, um, originally, when I was making these piles, I would build this up and then I would move uh, finished compost on top of the pile. And that seemed like something, you know, I'm taking uh, my finished compost from over here and putting on uh, back on top of here and it seemed like a step that I didn't really need to do. So I've gotten around doing that by just mixing this whole pile. I put the forks on the tractor and I shove them in there and I lift it up and shake it and that mixes it up. And that way I get what's on the outside, inside, what's on the inside, outside, and that uh, gives me a more finished product. Yeah, this is sort of like my staging area of uh, finished product. But if you look at it, there's 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 a lot of substance to this stuff. There's you can see the shavings from the manure, you can see bits of straw still from the uh, you know the hay that wasn't eaten, a couple of twigs from the poor quality of hay that came in, some wood chips. Here's some wood chips. Sometimes I'll scrape up the wood chips that are on top of the pipes. But that fiber helps to create a, you know, a product that's going to suppress weeds and it's going to stay on the bed all season long. Over here, this is like the remnants of what was, what's left over from uh, this year's. So uh, this is what that looks like after sitting for a year. And we'll just dig into the ear. That's some nice material. I'm hoping to, oh, there's a worm. Hoping to find more worms in here. Here we go. Sometimes I'll dig into here and just it'd be red with worms. It's just beautiful. And that's what goes on our beds. All right, like this video if you like this video. If you are not subscribed to this channel, hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. You can always support more videos like this, as well as the videos I make by going to notillgrowers.com and picking up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook or a hat, or just go to patreon.com slash notillgrowers and sign up. But like I said, this video series is literally a product of your support. Or you can always just hit that super thanks button. That works too. Super thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye. Um, and it's, it's wonderful to work at. And I feel like I'm like, I have to restrain myself from calling the staff over and say, look at this, look at this soil. Isn't, this is flocculation. See the tendency of the soil to form small aggregates. That's the organic matter holding the mineral particles together. This is what we do. This is why. And it's, it's hard for me to not do that.